Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. You can't spend more than two minutes online these days without being assailed with scaremongering about the so-called woke agenda. Right-wing politicians like Donald Trump and media pundits like Douglas Murray, organisations like Turning Point, they're constantly ringing the alarm bells about the dangerous, creeping influence of what Elon Musk, for example, describes as the woke mind virus. But it seems to mean everything from abortion rights to the latest Star Wars television show. Can we cut through all of this? What do communists say? What do we think is going on here? Because this question is tied to a broader phenomena, which we've commented on before on Marxist.com and on this podcast, culture war. And to help us explain what's meant by that and how uh, communists see the fight for liberation and the distracting tactics of all the wings of the ruling class, we're very happy to have with us Yola, who is a leading member of Defunca, soon to be the RCP, the Austrian section of the Revolutionary Communist International. Yola, it's really great to have you on. Thank you for having me. Hello. Spectre is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new. So Yola, do us all the favor. Do something that no bourgeois of, of any political stripe seems capable of doing, and explain to us what does woke actually mean. Uh, well, I think the uh, point is that nobody knows exactly, but uh, I think the fact is that there is a lot of discontent and anger in society. People are really um, frustrated that their lives are getting harder, uh, that the cost of living crisis um, is increasing, uh, that they see the world crumbling around them uh, with the climate catastrophe, natural, natural catastrophes, and people are looking for answers and uh, what we, what we can do to against this. Um, and uh, basically what is happening is that uh, right-wing demagogues, um, instead of giving an actual answer to these problems, they pick up on the frustrations and anger of these people and, and divert it into issues uh, that are very cheap for them to answer, where they can make cheap uh, points in the media, basically, uh, without tackling the real underlying uh, problems. So basically, uh, what they're doing is they, they, they're diverting a real potential class anger that exists into um, the language of identity and culture war. You use the term identity, and this comes up a lot, the question of identity politics. What does identity politics actually mean? Um, I mean, in a way, these, what these right wingers are doing, they're reacting to a trend that is actually uh, a quite liberal um, idea and set of ideas and trend, if you will, um, which says that uh, there are a lot of real problems in society like women's oppression, LGBT oppression, racism, uh, and these uh, liberal, uh, these identity politics uh, gives uh, the answer that the problem uh, lies in uh, the identity of people, that is men that oppress women and uh, the existence of men is the problem, that uh, white people um, oppress uh, black people and uh, the existence of uh, white supremacy um, is the problem. So they, they answer that this is um, a question of identity, where these problems come from. They're divorcing these real problems from the underlying material root, the class problem, that is uh, the reason why these um, oppressions exist. And because uh, liberals and uh, yeah, this identity politics trend has uh, pushed this in this sphere into the sphere of identity, of language, of culture, um, without tackling the root problems either. Uh, what these right wingers do, they react to this uh, as well on this uh, level and this uh, identity and culture. It seems to me that the reason that politicians like Trump are able to exploit these social issues in this way to distract people from the real causes of the problems in society is because of a general collapse of confidence in the um, political establishment and often they speak as though they're standing against the establishment they say oh washington brussels is all full of these woke liberals these college educated snooty types who look down on ordinary people and they've got contempt for ordinary people and they're trying to force their values down your throats. Um, what's the connection between the culture war 
and this weaponizing of, of identity politics and the discrediting of liberalism, which has kind of been like the, the dominant political philosophy of the ruling class uh, for the last period. Yes, we can really see that with the crisis of capitalism, all the old institutions, all the old beliefs um, and uh, everything that's connected to them uh, is really... Uh, yeah, becoming discredited and hated, like uh, parties that would uh, win elections for decades and decades dominate the political system in, in countries like the Labour Party and the Tories and the UK or yeah, in, in Austria and Germany, social democracy and the Conservative Party and so on. Mm -hmm. They're losing um, support and um, everyone can see that they're complete uh, hypocrites. They're attacking the uh, living standards of the people. They uh, increase the military budget. They force through austerity in the health sector, in the public sector. Uh, they attack the wages um, while using the language of identity politics, while coating their attacks uh, with uh, claiming that it is in favor of women's rights or in favor of LGBT, by giving themselves a progressive image. And uh, this means that uh, there is a really like uh, an anger and a frustration with this, uh, yeah, with these liberals. So you can really see with the decline and the crisis of capitalism, all the ideas and um, uh, image they give themselves, they're discredited with it, together with it. Uh, this is also because these liberals have used identity politics or uh, the real problems of oppression. Uh, as a fig leaf uh, to attack the working class. For example, um, in many countries now, uh, the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, they really want to um, attack the pensions. They then would attack this pension using uh, uh, claiming that it is in favor of uh, feminism or women. Um, in Austria, very popular demand is, for example, the pension splitting, where they suggest that uh, men should basically give part of their pension money to their uh, wives with le less pension money, uh, which means uh, the whole family has the same amount, amount of money, which is not enough. But in the name of uh, women's liberation, uh, you should split it uh, amongst each other instead of saying the pensions should be a pension you can live off. Things like this um, completely discredited the, the idea of fighting for women's liberation uh, in the eyes of many people who, who can see through this hypocrisy, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And this hypocrisy really gets to the core of the issue. My country's foreign secretary, David Lammy, has recently attended the UN General Assembly and he made headlines by saying that he, as a black man, recognises what imperialism is. He knows imperialism when he sees it. Talking about um, the war in Ukraine, using that to justify the commitments of three billion pounds a year in support to a war that's already lost, that's just going to result in more deaths for the longer that it goes on, more economic dislocation. And at the same time, the Labour government has cut the winter fuel subsidies for um, old age pensioners, which means that they're going to freeze over the Christmas period, basically. So on the one hand, they give away money to basically support America's um, losing war on Ukrainian soil with Russia, but take money away from essential infrastructure, the little tiny crumbs, the little tiny handouts available to the most vulnerable layers of society. And they justify that using the language of identity politics, using the language, the, the superficial language of anti-racism in order to justify policies that exact misery upon millions of ordinary people. And the Democrats in America, of course, uh, are famous for this. Um, Kamala Harris is now the Democratic nominee. She's going to take on Trump in a month or two. And the kinds of language used by the liberal press in America and throughout the world to celebrate Kamala Harris, you know, she's, she's a black woman and she's a strong woman and she's opposing Donald Trump, who's obviously this, you know, racist caricature. They celebrate this as some amazing leap forward. When you look at her actual policy program, she's defending the same imperialism. She's defending the same economic policies that brutalize working people. She's fundamentally exactly the same as any bourgeois politician. But her campaign is given this sort of progressive look of pain just because of who she is, not what she actually stands for. And you can absolutely see why in a context of crisis, millions of people are really fed up with these double standards. Yes, exactly. There are so many examples for this. Uh, for example, all these uh, 
a climate issue as well, uh, where they claim that they want to rescue the environment. Um, but actually they used uh, this green coated capitalism for many years in the last few years to uh, justify um, uh, border taxes, like a trade war, basically saying that we have to defend our industry against the bad uh, Chinese industry, which is very bad for the environment, and therefore we have to introduce the taxes, but who pays the bills for the CO2 taxes and so on? It's in the end, uh, the masses, the workers that have to buy products that are uh, much more exp expensive, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, and they really use this identity question uh, to try to garner support to make force basically workers who, who hate the right wingers also um, to, to support the lesser evilism basically mm. so um i think this is another uh, important point in all of this uh, superficial um, identity politics that um liberals uh, use it shamelessly to get uh, voter support again and again for their policies that attack the working class by basically scaring uh, ordinary workers and youth who are afraid of the right wing as well mm. um uh, that if you don't vote for them then uh, you will basically have fascism, which is a complete exaggeration and, and not true. Uh, basically force them into the camp of uh, of the liberals that uh, then use the support to attack uh, the workers nonetheless. So this lesser evilism. But uh, but also because they, they portray this uh, question of oppression and uh, of, of minorities and so on, of women and so on, as a question of identity, the, the solutions they put forward. They're, they're basically completely uh, useless and even counter uh, counterproductive. It's not only that you should vote for representatives of a certain identity that then forces through uh, uh, bourgeois po uh, policies, but it's also these ideas of quotas that you need representatives, that only representatives of a certain identity can really help to fight this oppression, which is a wrong idea. You just have to look around uh, that many supporters of uh, the worst uh, policies are... Uh, um, Drawn a tiny minority of oppressed uh, of oppressed minorities are drawn out and basically pushed up um, as representatives of the system. You you, you spoke about uh, David Lemmy. He's he's one example, but um, actually, for example, the the leader of the German uh, AfD party, the very right wing party, yeah. um, she's in a, a same sex partnership. Uh, she's right. a, clearly a, a, a representative, uh, basically, of the LGBT community, but obviously is not acting in their interests. Yes. Um, just as uh, Meloni is not uh, helping the women of Italy and so on. So this idea that you have, you need to be part of a, a, an identity group in order to uh, fight this oppression is a very uh, wrong idea that is also consciously used by the ruling class. Yeah, of course. I mean, Meloni who supports the abolition of abortion. She's backed by the Catholic right. She supports policies that are completely contrary to the interests of the vast majority of women, but she is a woman, so there we are. We've achieved representation. I've always said that if you follow this logic of representation to its end point, then presumably in Britain, Margaret Thatcher would have to be considered a feminist icon because, look, she was the first female prime minister decades before... Um, most other major political parties had a female head of state. What did she do? She carried out policies that destroyed huge communities in big swathes of the UK, particularly the industrial north and, and Wales. And guess what? Half the people living there were women. So she exacted terrible, terrible misery upon millions of women. And this is the other thing. I mean, the, the liberals, the liberal politicians and, and the right reformists, they'll use the language of anti-racism. But they carry out policies that attack migrants. They carry out policies that pursue imperialist agendas abroad. Uh, they do exactly the same thing in deeds as the right wing, in effect. I mean, on this question of abortion, which has come up a couple of times, Roe versus Wade, which was the only piece of legal federal protection for abortion rights in the states, was repealed under a democratic administration. Yes, exactly. And I think uh, this all uh, boils down really to the, the root problem of um, identity politics and the philosophy that lies behind it. Because obviously you have this very hypocritical um, uh, capitalist politicians um, that use identity politics. But then some people might argue, well, they're just abusing ideas that are actually meant for liberation. Um, if you do it and if you use these ideas in a correct way, uh, it has a complete different um, outcome. Mm. But uh, I would say this uh, problem 
um, lies in the root of of this phil the philosophical base of this identity politics, uh, which is explaining oppression not because um, of class society and uh, the capital system, but because of identity, um, and which ha uh, yes, and it, and uh, thus uh, the the fundamental proposition, even if you're a well very well meaning person, uh, will never work to um, to actually get rid of oppression. Uh, you cannot. Get rid of uh, women's oppression by abolishing men, and you cannot get rid of um, LGBT oppression or racism by abolishing uh, white people or uh, heterosexuals. But um, you can abolish oppression if you abolish classes. Mm. Um, this is the fundamental difference between the class question and the identity question. In order to win, the working class has to defeat the capitalists and actually can eradicate the root problem of oppression. But um, in order to win women's oppression, you cannot um, abolish uh, the root problem as being as it being men. So this is a fundamentally wrong proposition, and that's why it can be used um, as it's seen fit by representatives of the ruling class so easily, uh, and it's very uh, and they really like to use it because it gives them a progressive image. I'd like to talk a bit more about this question of the of the culture war, um, turning culture into a battlefield. Because, you know, you, you listen to the people on the right who really bang on about the woke agenda and they're obsessed with, you know, black stormtroopers in Star Wars movies and gay mermaids in uh, Disney movies or a trans person in a video game. And they whip up this hysteria around these, I wouldn't even say secondary, but these completely irrelevant questions in the field of culture. But it has a certain effect on a certain layer. And I think we should also say that the, the crisis of capitalism, it's also a crisis of reformism. And we saw over the last decade, certainly, that there were a few left reformist figures with mass movements behind them. People like Jeremy Corbyn here in Britain, Bernie Sanders in the USA, Podemos, Syriza and, and, and others who were able to galvanize support for left wing social policies, policies that, you know, dealt with austerity dealt with funding healthcare, um, providing free education, this sort of thing, drawing out the class question. And they were extremely popular for a time. Obviously, they were defeated and they disappointed their supporters, but they captured some of that mood. Do you think that it's fair to say that if you had anybody on the left offering a, a class-based or, or, or a social uh, program that got to the actual hearts of why people are suffering. You know, where does the cost of living crisis come from? Why can't you afford to heat your home? Why can't you afford to pay your rent? Actually pointed the finger at the rich, at the capitalists, at the wealthy parasites who are responsible for all this. I feel like that would quite rapidly cut across these silly superficial questions. Yes, I, I think that's definitely true definitely true and we saw how it happened before and i think it's also important that we do not draw the conclusion because um, identity is not the solution uh, therefore we must ignore these questions uh, we should not talk about uh, women's oppression homophobia and these things this is not the conclusion we draw uh, we take this uh, up but um we take this problem seriously, but we have to connect it to the class cl question, actually, mm. um, and uh, cut through uh, this uh, fog of um, uh, reactionary propaganda, but also explain that the way the liberals are dealing with, the, dealing with this is actually only increasing and an angering part of uh, of uh, the working class because everyone one can see through this hypocrisy. So yes, uh, cutting through uh, to class question, I think this is one of the main tasks that com communists have to do. Uh, talk about uh, the real problems and say basically, uh, not the migrants are stealing your jobs, it's the capitalists and their need for profit that is actually attacking your wages and creating unemployment. Mm. Um, and therefore your re reaction should not be to blame your uh, migrant co-worker and all the Ura representatives uh, to, who claim that this is the pro problem, who p push a racist agenda. They're just lying. We have to yes. cut through these lies and, and connect the class question with the question of um, oppression because ultimately we cannot uh, 
if we are di divided, we cannot win. We need the unity of the working class to attack mm. uh, the capitalist class, the root question. We have to create this unity of the working class. Mm. Uh, and therefore, we have to bring forward the class question and uh, say that uh, the, the interests of uh, oppressed minorities is not uh, against uh the interests of any other worker, but actually you need each other in order to fight together. Mm. And this question of unity versus division, I, I think, is really important um, because I think that hopefully it's been made abundantly clear at this point. But communists, in spite of what the likes of Donald Trump and Turning Point USA, um, J.D. Vance might tell you, do not support identity politics. We think identity politics is reactionary, subjectivist, idealist poison that diverts oppressed and exploited people against one another or splits them off into little silos of oppression rather than drawing them together in a common struggle against the root of all oppression, which is the capitalist system. But we're not saying that Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, uh, Ron DeSantis, Maloney have, or Javier uh, Millet have the answers either. I mean, these people are also part of the establishment, in spite of the way they might pose themselves sometimes. They also support the capitalist system, and they play divisive identity politics from their own side. Yes, basically what we have here, and this is uh, the essence of the culture war, is uh, one side of identity politics uh, against a different side of identity politics. And mm. uh, both sides serve the capitalists and they play with it consciously. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think this is also important to see. These are these are calculated uh, moves as well by uh, on the side of politicians, on the liberal as well as the right wing side. I mean, there was a recently a very interesting um, article in the Financial Times where they interviewed a, a boss of a chemical, a big a chemical industry in Germany, Evonik, and he says he presents himself as very progressive because he says, um, I'm against the AFD in Germany, this right wing party. Um, I'm, uh, I'm for tolerance. And he says, uh, the AFD is damaging our economy, our society and our future. This is a quote. It endangers everything from human rights to foreign investments. And you can see in one sentence, like putting forward the um, fig leaf of human rights and tolerance mm. and putting it together what this is actually about, which is his investment chances. Right. And this becomes even clearer when he goes on, where he says, yeah, I'm against this AFD. Uh, what, what I care about, he says, for his workers, only two aspects have relevance to be. Be tolerant and perform. Do your job. So this is what <laughs> he wants his workers to do. And, and then he even goes on. Like, be woke he's and work a, hard. Yeah. But then, uh, like presenting himself as very tolerant and so on, he goes on and says, like, but there was this case where the German national football team in the uh, World Cup in Qatar or something, uh, they they put uh, on this LGBT armbands as a show of support uh, for LGBT rights, which is a tokenist symbolic uh, gesture, uh, just um, as many symbolic gestures, but against this he, he he's very against this he says this was a disastrous idea this bands because he, i quote a good amount of colleagues from german industry had to scramble to repair relations with top representatives of the arab world mm. so again it's about investments it's about his profits uh, when it's useful for him he takes it up as a fig leaf when it's not useful he discards it and that's the, the uh, identity politics in a nutshell it's about saving uh, the interest of the capitalist and using it as a fig leaf as as they see fit yeah it reminds me a little bit as well of when uh, Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner while they were still in opposition the Labour Party in Britain uh, taking the knee during the Black Lives Matter protest with a big stage photograph in Whitehall or something but then supporting the Tories um draconian crackdown on the right to protest and basically waving through or abstaining on a series of bills that have made it very difficult to protest legally and effectively in the UK. And also at one point saying that it was right that people should be put in jail for 10 years if they defaced statues of slave owners. Yes, uh, I mean, we've been saying it a lot in this podcast until mm. now that the true root of oppression is capitalism. But I think we should also make explicit why that is the case. Uh, capitalism uh, needs, uh, on the one hand, uh, the working class divided. 
So this is really a, a big, important issue. This is why they can never give up oppression uh, fully because they need the working class divided. Uh, they need uh, them put against each other. And um, for, for many reasons, this is very profitable for them, uh, directly even. For example, if you have uh, a, a number of migrant workers in uh, insecure, half legal or even illegal situations uh, where they have to offer their labor for very cheap. This is very useful also to pressure the wages of all the working class because you, you basically have a cheap uh, competition within the working class ready all the time um, to push down all the wages. But uh, obviously also you want to keep the workers from uh, being uh, standing in solidarity against the bosses. So you play out the, the racist card and so on. And, and, and especially also women's oppression. I mean, the, the role of the family for capitalism, um, it's very necessary, uh, to push a lot of, um, uh, labor basically in the, in the private field. Like it should be done in the private, uh, home, um, where children should be reared and so on. Um, so that, uh, they they don't need to spend a lot of money on uh, public services, public kindergartens, public schools and so on. So, it is really fundamentally a necessity for capitalism to upkeep oppression, play with it on this or that occasion, to play, play, play with it uh, like I'm progressive, I'm for this and that. But fundamentally, when it's about uh, upkeeping your profits, um, they, they can never get rid of um, oppression fully. Uh, they would never. And this is why it's really like fundamentally the, the class question is connected to the question of uh, liberation of all kinds of oppression. Hmm. That's right. And it's also why... Um right-wing demagogues like Trump, like Millet, like Maloney, they might be able to tap into a mood of anger and frustration at the liberal establishments, but they don't have any answers. They can't actually provide an alternative. They can't deal with those class questions because they're the class enemy. They represent or literally are the, the billionaire capitalists, the big business owners. They want to maintain the division and subjugation of the oppressed and exploited so you know they can they can demagogically score points by you know attacking the double standards and hypocrisy of the liberals but it's not as though that they they have any solutions there are no there's no content to their criticism of identity politics and i think we should be clear this is what distinguishes the the communist criticism the marxist criticism of identity politics from the criticism that comes from the right wing, demagogues, actual racists, um, who, as you say, really just adopt an identity politics of their own. And they cynically use these these criticisms in order to win support to themselves so that they can carry out the interests of the capitalists. We say we oppose identity politics because it prevents the unified struggle of the working class against all the wings of the establishments. But I wanted to come back on something that you said earlier, which was, which I think is important. You said that this is used consciously. Uh, it's not just something which the there's this wing of the ruling class has sort of groped towards um, by accident. It's something that's being intentionally used. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, I mean there are many examples for this. I think one very prominent example is um, the question of, of Palestine, right. the question of solidarity with uh, the Palestinians uh, against the genocide, um, because we can see how uh, a big part of the propaganda of uh, imperialism of Israel and uh, of the supporters of Israel in the West uh, is using anti-Semitism, the argument of anti-Semitism against anyone who stands in solidarity with the Palestinians. Right. Um, and, and, and I mean, this is, uh, we have seen this so many times with the invasions of imperialists in other countries where they say this is for human rights and this is for democracy. And here we see this again with uh, the particular extra of using anti-Semitism as a um, as a, a weapon to silence anyone who stands with the Palestinians. Um, and, and this is, uh, of course, a very conscious uh, campaign. This is particularly strong, especially in Austria and Germany, where, where, where we have the past, the fascist past of, of Hitler fascism. Mm. Um, and this is really, um, sowing a lot of doubts, uh, amongst the uh, youth and honest, uh, uh, class fighters who, who are against this oppression, but feel unsure whether they're might be actually anti-Semitic if, uh, uh, if they are if they're standing with the Palestinians. 
But yeah, there are many examples. Like, uh, for example, um, in order to justify imperialist uh, warmongering and militarization and huge military budgets, uh, the the German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, she has, I think it was last year, she has published a feminist foreign policy, uh, a document where she says now uh, the German feminist, the German foreign policy is now feminist. And she right. unironically uh, says that we should ge have gender sensitive export controls of weapons. So exporting weapons and using them as war is completely fine as use as, as long as there's some women on some, um, board that control these experts in a feminist way. Oh, and she even nice. says, we should, we should have a uh, research, we should research the specific impacts of nuclear weapons on women. And here it becomes uh, very obvious that, uh, this is, <laughs> This is a conscious tool to um, use uh, the questions of identity for extremely reactionary imperialist policies. Uh, uh -huh. Nobody can say that this is uh, in the interest of any woman to export nuclear or other weapons. No, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know if maybe you can tell me, Yola, if women are, are more resistant to radiation or the the heat of a nuclear bomb. I didn't realize that women, I don't know, melt and irradiate differently to men, but that's quite a revelation on behalf of the German foreign minister. I think there was also some uh, NATO reports a couple of years ago that talked about the fact that there are a greater number of female drone operators than um, in the past, which was presented as this great progressive leap forward because now there's a more equitable share of women who are dropping payloads of weapons from a very great distance on top of defenseless and unarmed people in the Middle East. I wanted to come back to this question of anti-Semitism and the weaponization of identity politics to attack the left. Um, and it is to attack the left. And I think this is something which is it's deliberately misunderstood by the right wing when they scaremonger around the so-called woke agenda. Um, this idea that it, it, it's the left that always uses cancel culture and will weaponize identity in order to get its way. I mean, the liberals do that to a certain extent, for sure. But in, in the main, the, the big weaponization of identity politics uh, is clearly against the left. I mean, the movement for Palestine has been a mass movement. Millions of people all over the world have been involved in the uh, marches that have broken out in, in, in major cities and in dozens of countries to oppose the slaughter going on in Gaza. And the police, the courts, in some cases, Zionist goons um, supported by and abetted by the police have all been used to attack protesters. I know that some of our comrades in Austria were investigated under anti-terror laws in order to shut down our criticism of Israel's policy in the Middle East, in, in, in Gaza and the West Bank. And it's always with the argument that it's anti-Semitic to criticize the only Jewish state. That's quite literally identity politics. That's saying, you can't talk about this, you can't criticize this because you're not Jewish. You can't understand how we feel about this and therefore you're a racist, you're a bigot and you deserve to be beaten up, locked up and shut up. And this has a certain effect on a certain layer, as you say. I remember in, in my country during the height of the Corbyn movement when the anti-Semitism allegations against Corbyn were really kicking into gear. And it wasn't actually the first example that they tried to use um, against him. It wasn't the first time identity politics was used against that mass movement. First of all, he was accused of being sexist because... I guess because he was an old white guy and there weren't enough women in his shadow cabinet or something. He was accused of being a Czech spy. Uh, I think he was accused of being racist against people of color as well. I forget the justification for that one. But eventually they happened upon this criticism that he was anti-Semitic. And the reformist left, you know, well-meaning um, people in, in, in many cases, didn't know what to do because they couldn't stand, they couldn't tolerate being criticized as something as abhorrent as an anti-Semite and they couldn't answer back that no this is a lie this is slander you're not arguing in good faith because they were also affected by the logic of identity politics which says what you have to take the um, perspective of the accuser as good coin 
because you can't tell somebody of an oppressed identity how they should and shouldn't feel. If a Jewish person tells you you're being an anti-Semite, then that's all there is to it. Even if they're doing that, in the case of Benjamin Netanyahu, for example, in order to shut down criticism of an ongoing genocide. So identity politics strangles a mass movement in this country, and it's being used to attack a mass movement that's been going on for the past year all around the world. Yes, uh, I think this is completely correct. I mean, um, if we say uh, that identity politics is a use tool used by the ruling class to divide the working class, it's not just in a general sense, ideologically, that the working class is pitched against each other, but it's actually also used to uh, destroy movements and to tr destroy organizations. And we have seen this time and time again. Uh, it was used against Corbyn. Um, in Germany, actually, there was a few years back a big movement, a huge movement um, for the... Uh, expropriation of a huge housing com company uh, that owned a lot of houses which were very uh, expensive and it was a, a huge campaign to to expropriate them and then they uh, suddenly very mysteriously the, this rumor started spreading that one of the main initiators was actually um, uh, accused of sexual assault with any uh, proof ever putting forward so it was used there it was used in, the, in the, one of the biggest union in the UK in unison when they had a left wing mm. majority in the leadership uh, and uh, then they were attacked by the right wing in the union um, to uh, because there were not enough uh, black representatives and as you've said um, in the in the question of Palestine um, it is actually used to persecute, to try to persecute uh, left-wing organizers, our own comrades, um, claiming that there were terror sympathizers, uh, that were accusations that were completely baseless and they have to be had to be retracted. Um, but I think it's really uh, connected to, uh, yeah, as you already uh, hinted, in, uh, to, to the philosophical base of identity politics. Because if you analyze the world from a subjective identity point of view, uh, 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 from the point of view of your um, own feelings, of your own experience, mm -hmm. um, whoever is oppressed, um, what they say is automatically the truth, um, is defined at, as the, the pinnacle of what is uh, oppressive or not, uh, then of course uh, this idea can also be abused, but also it um, actually um, it, it it makes the left uh, defenseless. I mean, um, we always say that ideas, correct ideas, are extremely necessary for revolutionaries. We're Marxists. We defend the Marxist ideas, uh, and this is because you can see if you do not have a firm analysis of uh, of the world, you can get uh, swayed. Um, this is the left is very susceptible to these attacks of identity politics because they feel like, yeah, we're left wingers. We should be, of course, on the side of the press. And if you don't have a firm, uh, theoretical basis, uh, where you can confidently say, well, actually, you're attacking us on identity politics basis. We fight against oppression with our class methods and your attacks are baseless and actually designed to re ruin a movement. If you do not have the confidence and ideas to, to, to push back these kind of attacks, this makes you very vulnerable. And you've, we've seen time and time again how reformists, how soft lefts, um, they they just give in. They they basically say sorry and sorry. Yes, you're right. We're very oppressive. We haven't thought about our privileges enough yeah. and things like we're gonna, that. We're going to self crit. Yeah. We're going to self reflect. Yes, yeah, self reflect our own privilege. Uh, as if uh, thinking about uh, the this privilege uh, will. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, this. What, what does the church do when you like flagellation? Uh, the self flagellation. The flagellant sects. Yes, exactly. And this, and this, uh, weakens the movement. So yes, you can say that uh, this, uh, identity politics being a tool, um, in the interests of capitalism, it's, it's not only an abstract idea. It's being actively used in the workers' movement against mass movements, against left wing organizations and organizers. This is also important to point out. Not only are communists anti racist, we're the only ones who are able to seriously fight racism we're the only ones who fight racism in anything other than words because this is the other thing isn't it the the right wing has a real bee in its bonnet about things like critical race theory um things like decolonized curricula um the influence of woke ideas in schools and obviously they have those criticisms for their own reasons in many cases just because they, they they really are racist and they really do think that colonization was a good thing and they really do support the history of the british empire and the um, imperialist interventions of the u.s and 
They probably have dodgy opinions about the slave system in the USA and race relations and this sort of thing. But communists, Marxists also say that at the end of the day, if you think that the way to fight racism is just to get a few more black authors on school curricula, if you think that the way to uh, fight for the interests of oppressed people is you know, just to be a bit more aware, which is you know where woke really comes from, a bit more aware of the history of racism, then ultimately the only kind of change you're going to get is a change in words. And we're not interested in the change in words. We're not, in, we're not interested in just fighting for you know more and more up to date terminology. We're not just we're not interested in just superficially talking and thinking about race and gender and sexuality in the right way. We're interested in liberating all oppressed people, black people, gay people, women, from the reality of their oppression, which, as you say, comes from a system that has need of ideological weapons of divide and rule. Basically, this this question of with with which methods do you actually fight oppression? I mean, uh, fundamentally, it's a question of uh, reform and revolution. Uh, what they're putting forward are often not even reforms um, for, for the masses, not even actual improvements, but in, in general, it's, uh, designed to, to give, um, representation, uh, give a tiny minority, uh, representatives, um, some chance to, to climb up the ladder, ladder, um, and, and become, uh, successful, uh, and then they will be represented, um, while the mass of the oppressed uh, do not see any benefit from this. And I mean, how do we approach uh, the question of whether reforms are something useful or something not useful? Uh, for us, reforms, we fight for reforms, we're in favor of reforms, if they help to actually increase the activity and consciousness of the workers and the oppressed. Is it, if it's, um, uh, if it's, uh, if it's a reform that actually gets people uh, involved fighting so that they can feel confident to actually uh, feel, yes, I can, I can do more. I can overthrow the system to get organized more in an active manner. But these kind of uh, tokenist reforms are not doing this at all. Actually, they're passivizing a big layer of the oppressed and the working class by saying, you don't need to do anything. Um, if Netflix puts on a show with a lot of gay characters, this is actually doing the work for you. All you need to do is reflect yourself and think and maybe do individual uh, one-on-one -on -one talk, convince one person after the other uh, by telling them they're actually unconsciously uh, racist or consciously racist, racist and so on. But basically passivizing um, the, the masses instead of saying, yes, you need to take your life into your own hand. You need to get active and fight a class struggle together. Um, and, and this is basically the uh, why we say we're not against uh, reforms. We're against reformism. The idea is that uh, you uh, subordinate all your thinking uh, to the idea of uh, be doing realistic politics. Yeah, it's very realistic to have um, uh one more black CEO somewhere, for example, or one more women woman CEO somewhere, uh, but it's unrealistic that uh, women and uh, female and male workers actually fight together against the boss. Uh, this is what the the method of reformism does, and this is a this is a dead end and not helpful. We judge uh, reforms uh, whether they're good or bad um, on whether they not only actually improve the lives of the masses but also get them active, get them thinking, get them involved, and think get confidence that uh, you're not alone. We're actually in this together and we can fight. There's another dimension to this, what's often called right-wing populism. Uh, I know that you gave a really excellent lead-off on this question at the RCI founding conference. You can find that in our sister podcast, The uh, School of Communism. And I recommend that everyone give it a listen. It gives a bit more context to this discussion. But another thing which I think we should talk about is that these right-wing demagogues, you know, people like Trump, for example... They do actually combine these attacks on the woke agenda, these attacks on the liberal establishment, with language that appeals, at least in words, to class issues. Um, Trump was able to bring down the blue wall in his first electoral run, for example, by talking about bringing the jobs back, fighting globalization, talking about the restoration of American industry. You see similar rhetoric from his running partner, J.D. Vance, in the course of this election. But the only reason they can do that, of course, these people who, I mean, Donald Trump, is he's literally a billionaire capitalist. He's almost like a, like a comic book parody of a capitalist. He couldn't be more obviously a, an enemy of working people. 
The only reason he's able to do this is because one, he presents himself as a maverick, as an you know a, an individual crusader against the um, condescending liberal establishment, but also because there's just this enormous vacuum because of how much the reformists, how much the so-called left have discredited themselves, have actually carried out the interests of the capitalists, carried out attacks where they've been in power or supported attacks where they've been in opposition. Yes, um, I think so. I mean, uh, the the reaction, of, like the, the, the right-wing demagogues, they do not only um, ga- gain points by uh, div- diverting everything into racism, they do that too, but they also pick up uh, real social questions, um, uh, talk about them, whereas others don't even talk about social issues like uh, wages, unemployment, and so on. Mm. They pick those up. Um, and claim to defend the interests of the workers, uh, bring back our jobs and so on. But then, of course, they give demagogic answers. But this is um, interesting. I mean, uh, we see this, for example, in Germany, where uh, the left party, a reformist party that is in a big crisis, had a split off where one of the these left party uh, politicians, Sarah Wagenknecht, um, formed her own party, and she has more success in the recent regional elections. Three important regional elections happened uh, in September. She had more success than the left party. She got like 13, 15 percent. Um, and uh, she does exactly that. She she comes from the left, but actually she mixes up anti-wokeness, uh, talking about the working class again, with some anti-migration and so on politics. And I think uh, the, the point is... Um, the, this only works because they, they don't give the real answers. They give lies as answers. They talk about the working class, but they do not, they not talk about the working class having to organize, unionize, strike and fight back. Um, but uh, the working class being very angry and this is a big problem. But then uh, basically what they should do is uh, vote for them. Uh, and uh, they don't have uh, a true working class uh, perspective, obviously, and no working class solution. But this is, um, yeah, this really shows that, uh, that the time is ripe for an actual class-based um, alternative, for actual class struggle. Like the, the whole situation screams for actual class fights, communist answers. Uh, and uh, as long as nobody is giving it to them, uh, to, to g- showing this alternative, being a visible alternative, um, this can be used in this demagogic way. Yeah, a dimension of the culture war that the right wing are really obsessed with at the minute is this question of traditional values and the traditional family. They even have this trend, mostly on social media, called tradcore, where you have people dressing up like 50s housewives and like making pumpkin flour from scratch. It takes like 12 hours and then they make pumpkin bread for their 13 kids and they all proceed in front of the camera dressed in these beautiful little matching dungarees. Um, and it's celebrated by these right-wing pundits and politicians to say, oh, this is what life should be. This is what the left, this is what the woke mind virus is trying to take away from you. They're obsessed with birth rates as well. I mean, there's a racist dimension to that as well, because what they don't, what they say quietly is there aren't enough white babies being born. But this obsession with the idea that the left, the woke left is trying to destroy the family it's actually one of the most long-standing criticisms that's leveled at communists that we want to destroy the family. But this obsession with like turning the clock back to this like imagined period where people could have 2.4 kids and live in a nice house in the suburbs on you know one um, income from a manual job. I mean, first of all, uh, good luck doing that these days with wages and house prices being what they are. But what do we say about this question of? traditional values is it is it true that communists are trying to destroy the uh, so-called traditional family communists do not want to destroy happy families and forbid anyone to live the way uh, as they want i think a lot of this propaganda uh, or this right-wing talk is also uh, obviously connected to really like uh, hateful ideas as well but of course there's also this element of nostalgia that uh, li- life in the past was easier and we see this in every system that is a, that is in a crisis that people will start thinking well wasn't it nicer in the 70s we've seen it when uh, capitalism emerged and people would say like oh weren't it wasn't it nicer in the middle ages and so on so this is this is a, on the one hand a normal reaction but the other thing is um we are in favor that everyone can live their lives as they want uh, mm-hmm. as long as they don't harm anyone uh, doing so but 
um, the truth is you cannot in this system, you cannot choose to have a truly fulfilling, loving family life if you choose so, because your constant uh, need, uh, like fear of not having enough family income, um, if it happens not to go well, um, then you cannot just leave your partner um, and and uh, do it on you, on your own. You cannot choose freely in the system. We want uh, a life for everyone where everyone can choose freely how to want to live and express themselves and their needs and their interests and their passions. But the truth is, um, capitalism does not allow it, uh, us to do that. So, to everyone, uh, anyone saying that the communists want to take away, um, well, uh, what they would like to have is uh, their we we don't want to take what you cannot even have in this system. We want uh, a truly free society where you can actually live as you choose. Hmm. Well, that brings us to the last and probably most important point, because you spent a lot of time in this podcast criticizing things we don't agree with. But what do we say needs to be done? We're against racism, we're against oppression, we're against these right-wing demagogues, but we're also against liberals, we're against identity politics of all kinds. So what is the answer? What is our positive program as far as fighting the scourges of oppression, but also providing a decent existence to people of all um, backgrounds, colours and creeds? Um I mean, uh, what is very, very clear is that uh, this system is dying. And actually, this is not uh, something that makes us sad because uh, what we see is there's a huge potential and a chance for an actual revolution happening. The working class is the most powerful force in society in potential. Uh, it produces uh, almost all of the wealth there is in society, but it doesn't control it. Um, if we put our minds together, we could use all these resources that are being wasted for the profits of a tiny minority for the good of uh, of the masses, of the working class, of the people. We want uh, to put uh, control into our own lives. And uh, this will be, be the material basis where we can actually um, ab abolish all these uh, sorts of oppression. So our, our positive, our message is actually very positive. We're against class alien ideas, but we're actually in favor of solidarity and unity of the working class, fighting together, uh, recognizing their strength and uh, the most important task of, of communists is uh, to organize everyone right now who already sees this as as uh, as the way forward. Um, I mean, um, the revolutions and revolutionary situations are implicit in this deep crisis of capitalism. We have seen it in in Bangladesh and in Kenya and so on. When uh, when uh, where, where people. Uh, are, are fed up and uh, are ready to 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 get rid of the system to really fight um against uh what is actually the problem this is hugely inspirational uh but this needs to be organized this potential this force needs to be organized and prepared in time and this is what's com what communists are off um, offering uh let us not be divided but fight together and everyone who is already right now ready to fight the system should get organized together all right, thanks a lot, Yola. And just to echo that point, if you're serious about fighting oppression in all its forms, if you're disgusted by the likes of Donald Trump, the AFD, Maloney, Millet, all the right-wing demagogues, but you also see through the hypocrisy, the double standards, and ultimately exactly the same class interests embodied by the liberals and the right reformists, then you need to join a revolutionary communist organization. If you're in Austria, that means joining the soon-to-be-formed uh, Revolutionary Communist Party. Yola, when are you guys actually founding, officially? Yeah, it's happening very soon, on 9th of November. On the 9th of November, um, you'll have a party to join if you're an Austrian communist. And throughout the world, you can find out where your nearest sectional group is and get involved in the Revolutionary Communist International. Yola, that was great. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. And we'll see you all next week. The is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism.